Ke ke sa mo president ne matamela le ke le motlwa di medis o di sebedisa ka o fela ke na sikose mg eh the head girl wa moriska 1975 ya mar eh i didn't stay long you know i left we left the country things were boiling but tc was my classmate Uh, when we did form four, a fierce debater. As hoa, una sensa kadi unko. Yeah. But of course, I'm not here to talk about me and CAC or anything like that. I'm just giving you context. Uh, I'm very, very happy to be a part of this uh, eighth uh, memorial lecture. I missed all the others for the simple reason that I was also outside the country once again, representing you, my people. Yes, I'm very grateful to the organizers, Bo uh, Omri, that they kept on asking us to come back to Morris. This is not the Morris we left behind. Morris was very small, much, much smaller. We didn't have this hall. I was passing over there. They said it's a music block. We had none of that. And to see that some of the things we were fighting for have been actually attended to is a very, very wonderful thing. Now, I know myself when I'm sitting there and the MC is talking forever that I become very agitated. So without wasting any time, I'm going to ask Pastor Silo Makoka, to please give us uh, the opening prayer. Is he here? Oh, Rawonara, please welcome.
Good afternoon. Thanks, Ambassador, Jeffrey Miller Machinini, and our honored guest. People sometimes, it's so sad when one comes back here, thinking back on those days that one was a student here. But also on the same side, I'm also happy that uh, I'm able to see some of the faces that were here together up until on that fateful day, the 16th of June, 1976. We never thought that uh, that day would become a historical day, both nationally and internationally. We thought we were just doing something, justice to the system, because our education at that time was not the education that would take a black child to the next level. It was just an education that will just keep us to be drawers of water and drawers of wood. But then, since he was there, and led us. And I'm happy that, uh, Ambassador, you mentioned that uh, Yes, he was the best of the debaters, and of which I'm so sad that uh, today's schools do not have debating teams. But nevertheless, it's something that our authorities will think about. Before we take our prayer, <coughs> I would like us all to stand and acknowledge those who have passed by, who are no longer with us. Just to bow our heads in memory of those who passed away. Thank you. May we still remain standing? Before we start everything, it's, it's right that we invited the Lord to be part and parcel of this occasion and also to grace this occasion. Tandy, as always, lead us with a song because you used to. Thank you. Let us pray. In the name of the Son and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Lord Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, all knowing, all seeing, we kneel before you, merciful, loving God. We bow our heads at the throne of your heavenly kingdom. Lord, we pray for all those who are homeless today, those who are less fortunate, and for the families who are searching for a place to live. God, you love us and the world so much that you gave up your only son so that everyone who believes in him may not be lost but have eternal life. 
Today, as we get out here together to commemorate the eighth memorial lecture of Chet Machinini, who, like your trusted righteous servant Moses, led a student of this great institution, Morris Isaacson High School, and other schools in defiance of the barbaric, brutal, apartheid Bantu education system, and took to the streets of Soweto to unchain themselves and to seek a better equal education for all black children of South Africa. God help me God. As we remember him and all those who have sacrificed their lives, our teachers, our families, who defied the apartheid system and laid down their lives, teach us to become who we are today. Father, hear our prayers as a family gathered here today before in mercy and love, unite all your children wherever they are. Father, we now celebrate this memorial of our redemption. We call Christ's death, his descent among the dead, his resurrection and his ascension to your right hand and looking for his coming in glory. Welcome into your kingdom, our departed brothers and sisters who have left this world. Remember, O oh Lord, all those who died in peace of Christ and all the dead, whose faith is only known to you alone. There we hope to share in your glory when every tear will be wiped away. God, the Father, creator of heaven and earth, pour down your Holy Spirit as the world over us has spilled more blood. There are many killings, murders, child and human trafficking, child slavery, drug and human trafficking, the world has abandoned and deserted you and your holy ways of life. In our country, South Africa, corruption has taken center stage. And those whom we have elected to lead us are not but working for themselves only. We humbly beg you, Lord, send down your Holy Spirit to heal our bleeding, beautiful country to restore it to its former glory, cry the beloved country. May this great, once beautiful country of our forefathers find in Christ the way, the truth, and the life. May all its light shine over the world. May it always search for the kingdom of God and his justice. We ask you, Lord, to pray and bless all of us gathered here today, our families, the family of Machini, and our honest guests. We ask all this to Christ of our Lord, your Son, who lives and reigns in unity with the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you. Thank you, Ndadi. Thank you for that prayer. Uh, I will call upon who is in charge, who is going to play us the national anthem. Yes, we are ready. Shall we stand for the national anthem? Thank you.
Thank you. We may be seated. Uh, because, before I call uh, Comrade Omri, uh, I'd just like to share that in Zambia they have exactly the same national anthem as ourselves. The only difference is that they don't have this other part here, South Africa. They have that original one, Yarona, that we were singing in all the three languages. And when you arrive there and you are being received as the ambassador, as I was there, then it's just recorded, it's musical. Now you can't tell. <laughs> you can't tell when they are playing the South African one and when they are playing the Zambian one. It just flows. It's like as if they are playing it two times. But I'm telling you, it's very, very touching because of our historical relations with that country, the country that looked after us during very, very bad times in South Africa. Ndade Omri, can you please come? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Comrade, uh, Comrade Ambassador. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is just a brief uh, announcement that we have uh, in terms of safety, in terms of any emergency. We've got the doors here, two and two there, and the one outside. So these doors are, can be opened anytime in case of an emergency. So when you're this side, you'll go out with those doors there. When you're this side, you'll go out with those doors. It's in case there's emergency. We hope there will not be any emergency. And uh, when you go out there through that main door, the bathrooms are this side, the ladies and the gents, in case you need any biological uh, uh, needs, you know. And uh, welcome to Morris Isaacson. Thank you. Thank you. For any program director, especially one that doesn't live in that community where they are program directing, this is the best part because then these people will not be overlooked, the guests. Because someone here called Ms. Lerato Salele is going to be the one to introduce us to all the guests and to welcome them all. So for me, it's a very special occasion to call you. Ms. Lalele, are you there in the front? Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Program Director, Ambassador MG. Ladies and gentlemen, our esteemed guests and speakers for today, the Honorable Dr. Padili Hosa and the Honorable Professor Zablon Villagazi the Machinini family, the Marisa Zixon High School management team, our esteemed alumni of the school, my fellow learners of Maurice, our esteemed guests gathered here with us today, all the viewers joining us across our nation and the global community. My name is Lerato Shalele and I am the RCL president of Marisa Zixon High School for 2023. And I feel so privileged and honored to welcome you all to our eighth annual T.A.T. Donald Tebucho Machinini Lecture. We welcome you all. I thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Lalele. When we were here, Banyana Vanevasa Apare Maru. We had those tunics, what do you want? The navy blue. And because I was coming from another school in Lesotho, I was very upset because when I went to buy my uniform, uh, you know, they are sold industrially in this country. They don't make you, they, they don't make them to fit you. You just go to those shops. They tell you, Mole Horekiswaza, Morisi, Moritza, Orlando, and so on. So mine was so short. I mean, I'm tall. 
You know, Barry, no, as long as it fits the shoulders, size 36. And then the rest thing, boom, my new come. Ay, 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 ay. I used to be very uncomfortable. <laughs> so hopefully, if they were trousers, maybe it would have been better. And then at least, waparali ba ikika udi mwabo, ukavara bo manyeu. Yeah, so it's good to see the improvements, really. It's very nice to come back home. I feel like a prodigal daughter. Yeah. Putanang Youth Trust representative, Kimis Kamohelo Mtenjana. And those programs, there were not so many women either. Give her a hand, please. Madam Program Director Ambassador Mchi, Honorable Guests, Dr. Badilo Hosha and Professor Ziblon Vilagazi, members of Boris Isaacson, members of Boris Isaacson, alumni, the Machininim family, Maurice Isaacson High Leadership and Learners, ladies and gentlemen, viewers at home, on all platforms, all protocol observed, consider yourself greeted. I stand here today and truly honored to be representing Putana News Trust. My name is Gatlewa Kathy Mtenjani, a final year Bachelor of Social Science student in the University of Cape Town and also the convener of Student Parliament in Cape Town. I am a young resident of Jabavu and a proud beneficiary of Putana News Trust. And therefore I stand here today to represent what is, student, what is Putana News Trust and what it stands for. The organization was established in 2004 in the community of Chabavu. So it's by its founder, a formidable woman, Mama Ruth Manala, and spearheaded by young, outstanding visionaries, Mr. Mudise Mutloba and Mr. Lance Manala. These individuals collectively saw it fit to drive the vision and mission of the organization with its focus of empowerment, especially youth empowerment, to uplift and inspire the entire community of Central Western Jabavu. With their various progressive programs and initiatives, the aim of Putanang Youth Trust is to fully address the socioeconomic challenges in and around the community of Jabavu. There's a saying that says, a safe community becomes a thriving community. That's one of the reasons and drives that PYT also supports members of this community policing forum by donating equipment they need to use in ensuring the community remains safe. When we are safe, therefore we strive. It is through the following pillars of PYT demonstrates their impact in the community and society. The first being education. The organization has to date offered 30 students with school support to further their studies at tertiary level to assist them to reach for their dreams. In 2022, a program aiming at addressing joblessness and encouraging career plus, plus entrepreneurship by dependable strengths in collaboration with PYT, where we witnessed young people being motivated to reach their potential. We proudly saw Lerato Sibuka and Tato Sidibe, both program participants of this memorial lecture, reaching their highest potential. We now have certified emotional intelligence coach and a full-time radio presenter, all thanks to the doors opened by Putanang's effort. Science and education is another pillar in our staple of initiatives to drive the evolution of young people from early learning to grade 12. We have introduced coding and robotics classes, roping in 25 learners in Jabavu from schools within the area. The learners are equipped with coding and robotics skills. This will be followed with advanced and latest technologies in the robotics space, ensuring that young people of Jabavu are on par with their peers nationally and globally. With the launch of PYT skills development programs, Putanang yet again, through collaboration, has ensured, has ensured that it champions the entrepreneurial spirit amongst the youth and the community to ensure that joblessness is eradicated. 
This is in line with the dreams of one fellow Chabavu resident and student who stood up and led the revolution of change and complacency in 1976. We, through our tireless efforts, are continuously inspired by the legacy of Tietzi Mashineni, and it is in this spirit that PYT for the past eight years was, has supported the Tietzi Mashineni Memorial Lecture to further evoke his vision for the youth of today and to keep his name, legacy, and memory alive. Long live to the spirit of Tietzi Mashineni. Long live. Long live to the Tietzi of... Long live to the spirit of Tieti Mashinini. Long live. Thank you and thank you, PYT, for the opportunities you give us and embodying the spirit of Ubuntu. Thank you. Wow. That was powerful. <laughs> you know, we worry about the younger people. You know, we, we ask ourselves, are they going to still have the same fire? Maybe it's a wrong question, but nevertheless, we do it. We ask ourselves, for a 10 years from now, 15 years from now, are we going to remain in the same stalemate that we find ourselves in? Or are there going to be younger people who came after us, like yourself, who are going to take the baton and take it forward? And when we come to events like this and we see some of you perform the way you, you do, then we know that, no, our future is guaranteed. Naganja, Naganja. Mr. Manaka, are you still here? He did approach me about coming in earlier. Did he leave? He was sitting at, at the back there. No, he was right there at the back when he talked to me about coming earlier. Or maybe he left. Maybe he left. Okay, in that case, uh, unfortunately, we have to swap. Professor um, Badile Khosla is not yet here, he's being delayed. So we will ask now our keynote address speaker, Professor Zeblon Zenzele Vilegazi, uh, the Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of the Vat Witwatersrand to come and speak to us. But before he does, I would like to take the honor of giving you his very, very brief CV. He was instrumental in uh, establishing South Africa's first experimental high energy physics research group at CERN, I'm sorry, I didn't even check what that is, CERN, maybe some of you know, working on the large hydron colliader. Ooh, these are physics terms that I never come across in my diplomatic life. <laughs> but anyway, it's about energy, and we all know what the problems of energy are in our country today. He has fostered international collaboration research as director of Itemba Labs, the largest cyclotron facility in the Southern Hemisphere, where he initiated a flagship, which means uh, something that is pioneer, of the rare isotope beam. Please don't ask me what those are. <laughs> project. In 2019, he played a role in securing a place for African academic partners in the development of practical applications through access to the IBM quantum. Not the IBM you and I know, you know, the, the corporation. I think this must be another physics-related uh, term like quantum. And in May 2020, Professor Zeblon Villagazi was elected 
as a fellow of the Royal Society of the UK. In case you think this is not a big achievement, unfortunately, when it comes to research, if you are not known internationally, if your work is not recognized by your peers internationally, you can research as much as you can locally, but that recognition that comes with being that kind of researcher will always escape you. Welcome to the more than 10 now Morris Isaacson students that I see here. I think it's a very good thing that you could also come. And in uh, concluding my uh, introduction of Professor Zeblon Villagazi, I see we also have Professor Padilla Khosla now with us. We see him on TV, so I can tell it's him. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, we've swapped your place. Maybe it's fortunate. Then you can take your breath. Yes, Professor Villagas, please take the floor. Thank you so much. When I was given an opportunity by my friend Mutlazi, whom I've known since 1987 to be here, I ought to have been traveling at this time of the year, but uh, you know, I didn't say no at all. Obviously, even if I said no, Mutlas would have even ensured that I come here. But it was actually a no-brainer. Uh, she was pushing through an open door. Uh, I'm a proud product, not of the school or of this neighborhood here, yeah, but on the other side of the Ryan Israel in Gatlohong. I matriculated in Fumana High School. But I remember this day very well. I was uh, six about to ten seven in 1976. And I'd like to dedicate this lecture to the mighty fallen who, whose fire evaporated to the Israel the next day and spread across the world. And as I'll say more about it, was led by people who did not fear, who had nothing to fear but fear itself. This is in their tribute. Before I started from my part, I also made an observation as I drove here, seeing how impressive the school is that students actually don't have to go all the way waking up at five in the morning, pupils or learners rather, don't have to wake up at five in the morning and go to schools in the, in the suburbs, where actually they're already disadvantaged because they have started the day too early and for a growing child, that's unhealthy. Therefore, it, it's incumbent upon us to ensure that we build our own schools here, in, like we all did in local townships, and one day some of you will have achievements that are beyond me, not because you have to go elsewhere, but you are educated in the community that nurtured you. And I think that's very, very important. And having said that as well, <laughs> and also the, uh, across the road, I saw that as a memorial. Um, and I, it's important that we venerate, we respect Sibonese Into Nipo Umlando Uwejo. Disappointingly though, and I think something that will be on a negative side of my speech because nothing is positive, is 100% positive in life, is that whenever I travel abroad in Washington, I've got an overseas uh, guest here, Arlington Memorial is venerated, the Vietnam Memorial is venerated. Uh, some years ago I was in uh, Moscow, the Memorial of the Fallen in the Great Patriotic War is venerated, it's like a church, it's a sanctuary. Uh, go to all these great memorials in uh, uh, London and statues of those British heroes uh, don't need security. People know. They kneel at the altar of the missing of the fallen ones. I looked at this. It's a beautiful memorial that I drove through. Of course, I never had the chance, but I found that it wasn't protected. I think is this going to exist? In Tlang, as you don't need the security. I was disheartened. It's a challenge for you, young people, to take a moment, go there, have a look, soak it in. This is an eternal flame that burned in 1976, and it must be our sanctuary. We must respect it. So that is my message to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Program Director Ambassador Mji, distinguished guests, the fellow keynote speaker, uh, Professor Lee Hota members of the uh, uh, Machinini family, other, other guests, uh, the uh, alumni of the school who are here today, 
members of the uh, broader Soweto community, some of whom are here, the learners of the school, our future, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ebron Vlagazi. I'll just say a few words. I'm a professor, so I promise you this lecture won't be 40, won't be 50 minutes, because we normally give 50 minute lectures. I'll be briefer than that. We live in a time of great changes, a time of great challenges, and a time of great expectations and fears. We live in a country going through major challenges in a world of great uncertainties about what our future will be. There's a uh, wisdom contained in an African proverb which rings through, rings through to, through the ages, echoing in all sectors of society. It reverberates in local, regional, and global events. It goes as following. For tomorrow belongs to the people who prepare for today. It is a class of 1976, which I might hasten to add, had a vision and daring to stand up to, in, to injustice. It was a time of great difficulties that required great people, great young people, to stand up and be counted, and they did. Now we face different challenges, and I'll address you. I was once in a position to quote from a former British politician upon you know, stepping down as a prime minister said, uh, in the past I was one, I was the future, now I'm the past. So I look at you, I do see my future, I'm not the past, you are the future. <laughs> This world, because I'm going to address you, because this, you're the future, in a rapidly changing world, both qualifications, either vocational or academic qualifications, will be relevant for the country and this continent's growth. The choice that you'll make, Bantanabami, will depend on your individual careers and who you are. My task today is to talk to you about the future of vocational training, given where we are. I'm of a strong belief that you don't need a degree to have a wonderful life. We, will... <laughs> we need people who will make sure that our trains run on time, who will fix our railway systems, who will make sure that our robots and traffic lights to the overseas gas work. Fitters die in tool, make... die in tool makers. People will ensure that our roads are filled up that doesn't get done by engineers. It gets done by people with vocational skills. There's a famous joke, how many professors does it take to, light, to, to change a light bulb? None, because their students do it for them. We are not the practical people. So the reality of the matter is that we do need, in this climate of high unemployment, people who can get things done. Not who can talk about things, we need to get things done. And it is through vocational training that we can get things done. <laughs> By adapting to uh, technological advances, we need to foster entrepreneurship, enhance the quality and accessibility of vocational training. You know, some of us who live, who live in the northern parts of this town, uh, whenever there's a burst pipe, right, or a case that's not working, the person that fixes you was a technician, Mr. Foslow, who actually learned that on the, on the fly, went to Valtech, as it was called, and now, is running a CC and making more money than myself. So that is what I'm talking about. That these are the people we need in society, and some of you must go for those vocational jobs that will make you viable citizens of the future and contribute meaningfully to our country. So as our technology advances, you need to have entrepreneurship. And I'm going to be very firm about this. We need to have local entrepreneurs who come from here running a business in, in Soweto, <laughs> who run businesses in Soweto, businessmen from whom you sell, go to local spaza, it must be a South African. I'm sorry, I have to say it, that when I was young, it was Babungwenya that sold us milk. It was that day, it was TAC, that ran a butcher. Who grew up, who knew the kids that came to, when we didn't have money to pay, they would say, Emma Pili Mwanaka, you know, uh, like two weeks later. Do you understand? So I'm not saying that it should be an exclusive economy. It must be inclusive, but also we need our own people contributing to that, to that economy. You can't wait for grants. You need to have your initiative. In recent years, technological advancements have revolutionized industries and created new opportunities. As I'm talking to you now, new industries and new jobs are being created, and they're not being created here. They're created 
in countries that are advanced in America, in the Silicon Valley, you've got what is called now artificial intelligence. You know, some of us have real intelligence here, yeah? but there is artificial intelligence of machines, of robots that can think faster than you. And Africa is falling behind. As the program director mentioned that uh, you've got this advance in what is called quantum computing. I'll give you an example. In 1969, there was a landing of a man on the moon. You've heard of that, right? Neil Armstrong. Just think about it. The computer that was required, I mean, the generation on my left here will know everything about it because they, were, they, they observed it. It was a big achievement for humanity. The, rob the computers that were needed to take these rockets goes up in the moon in tens and it's called um, rendezvous and docking and landing and one small step for mankind and so on and so forth and then back to Earth was done by a computer with about maybe 5,000 engineers uh, at NASA, and that computer had power which was a million times less than this. Now you have power in your hands that is a million times more powerful than the power of that rocket, right? So what does that mean? It means that these machines are evolving faster. You have now access to information for good and bad. That information is that in the past we used to wait for, now it comes to you. Now, what young people have is that they get exposed to things that they ought not to be exposed to, and that causes mental unwellness. I was talking to Dr. Um, Rataimani, who spoke about Prof. Rataimani, who spoke about mental un unwellness as a global problem. So these technological changes expose us to things like what you call these influencers, right, who actually uh, create a world that you don't belong to, and the self-esteem crashes. So there's a lot of issues we've got to solve in managing this technology, technology uh, exponential. In terms of the jobs that you need to have, we need to partner, create vocational and educational institutions and industries to work together to facilitate internship, that when you finish your metric, uh, even during your, the course of your metric, uh, you need to go, when, when I was young, there was a school called Ambach School for children who actually were, you know, had those skills that we need for society. And I think we need to relook that model uh, I don't have the, um, I'm not a policymaker, I'm just an academic, so I've got the academic freedom to speak my mind. But we need to relook that model. We need to relook uh, colleges that foster a particular craft, teacher training colleges, colleges that train technicians and engineers and, and tools and time makers. And then, of course, there will be a role for the, um, for, the, uh, for, the, for the academic part. In actual fact, proof shows that, and history shows that in the 1940s, with the end of World War II, Germany was destroyed. It was in pieces. So was Japan. Guess what created Germany by 1965 to now even come close to overtaking the UK as the largest economy? It was because German, what, Germans had what they call in German Fachschule, like, like Africans, Fach, trade schools. It is not trade schools that created that economic miracle. We need to actually have schools where young people at the age of 12 can, can have a form of streaming them into vocation, because at VET, we have 5,000 places for 80,000 applicants. So now what happens to the rest of these children? They go and uh, reroute traffic in uh, Joburg when lights are off, you know, and the, which is quite uh, sad. So we need to have an opening of all these opportunities of young people who will be entrepreneurial, who will be able to, without even needing a degree, to form their own Google to form an African-made Facebook that you speak to our challenges. I think as I close, I'd like to say that the future of vocational education and training in South Africa holds immense potential to address the challenges of skills development, entrepreneurship, and joblessness, given the fact that 60% of our young people, if I understand this correctly, are, 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 are jobless. By adapting to the technological advancements Fostering an entrepreneurial mindset, yes, you can do it yourself. You don't have to wait for that grant, but you can actually generate your own grant by selling Amando Pekas. That's how you made, made new, you know, selling peanuts. Just have that initiative. Don't wait for things to come to you. Okay, just grab that. Carpe diem, grab the day. We need to enhance the accessibility and quality of vocational training. I do believe that South Africa, if you do that, basic things, nothing else, no major policy, just tweak a few things here and there and get things done, we can prepare for the jobs of the future. 
We need to be targeted, we need to be focused, we need to ensure that we have a curriculum that speaks to that. We need industry to help us in that regard. And in this country of ours, despite the challenges, the uh, pastor opened up with a prayer that was a cry for help. Pastor, I can say that this country of ours is an exemplar of resilience. Many of you have fought against all odds in your lives. We have shown that great South African grit, resilience and focus. I am a naive optimist, and therefore I do see a great future. I do see great opportunities and challenges which lie ahead of you. You are symbols and majesty of what this country can offer. Our hopes of those that have supported you lie on your shoulders. I will conclude by an extract that I've taken from the speech of the late Robert Senate Kennedy, who gave it at UCT in 1966, called Ripples of Hope. Comfort is not the road, sorry, comfort is not the road history has marked for us. There's a Chinese curse which say, may we live in interesting times. Like it or not, we live in interesting times. There are times of danger and uncertainty, but also the times of the most creative of any time in the history of mankind. And therefore, here will ultimately be judged and ultimately be judged by yourself on the effort that you have contributed to building a new world, society of beauty, to the extent that your ideals and goals will have contributed in shaping that effort. As I conclude uh, from the speech, which is reflective of that class of 1976, it goes as following. It is from the uh, numberless and diverse acts of courage and belief that human history is shaped. Each time an individual stands up for an ideal or acts to improve a lot of others and strikes out against in, in, injustice. He sends forth a tiny ripple of hope, and each tiny ripple of hope will cross each other from a different million corners and centers of energy and daring. Those, those ripples will build a massive current that can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. So for each and every one of you, is that ripple of hope. See yourself as a ripple of hope that will coalesce with other ripples and join the other, other ripples to form a tidal wave that will take us to the future that our founding fathers who fought for this country dreamt, dreamt for. I thank you and good luck and may, be the, and may, be the, may the force be with you. Thank you. another round of applause. So relevant, so relevant. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to go a little bit back into the program. Uh, we had uh, Ms. Lalele introduce some guests, but in the meantime, some have just arrived, others were here, we just overlooked them. I'm sorry for that. So we need to know who's in our midst, especially if uh, they've come from far and wide, and also that they had other things to do, but they chose to be here today. So in no order of importance, I'd like to welcome as well, because others were already welcome. Professor Rataimani, can you stand? Let them see you. Also an alumni. Tagaga, Tagaga. <laughs> uh, this gentleman I haven't seen, I'd love to see, Mr. Sekheto Savangani, who is the deputy principal currently of Morris. Where is he? He's not here? Oh, okay. I thought, you know, when I call them, at least I'll be able to put a face to them, yes. Of course, Mr. D. Mashinin is here. He is his brother. <laughs> uh, Professor Padile Khosla joined us. You're also welcome. <laughs> uh, other people who've also since joined us, Professor Inos Ngujani. <laughs> oh, nice to see you. Advocate Homozo Moroka. Uh, 
Where is she? Ke motse ba ile motlana nna. Advocate Ak Aik Kumalo. Mr. Ish Mkimbele Mkabele Mkabele No, no, the handwriting The handwriting Ish Mkabele Let's say it, let me say it properly No, it's the handwriting that The person who wrote here yeah, no problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And whoever else we have not introduced, we have not recognized, please feel welcome. Everybody's welcome. No matter where you came from, whether you're a professor, whether you're a resident, whether you're a student from Maurice Isaacson, Please do feel welcome. At this juncture, thank you. At this juncture, I'd like to call uh, the poet. I'm told he's going to come from the door, Mr. Manaka.
truth about nature is that it never lies. So it's in your nature to be, my sister. It's in your nature to be. Our children, our children will never be afraid of art. Yeah! Can we give him another round of applause? I've been told that there are colleges overseas where they teach Ubuntu as a philosophy. But the sad thing is that we, the people who own the concept of Ubuntu, we have forgotten about it and we are not doing anything about reviving it, uh, which is unfortunately a reflection of the times we are living in. But on this particular occasion, I must say, all of us are making an attempt of remembering that if you don't know where you're coming from, you will not know where you are going. Because how to go to the house and go to the house and go So we should always keep that in mind. Now my next guest, before I introduce my next speaker, keynote speaker, I forgot to introduce our sister here, all the way from the US of A, Monica Swan who's visiting us today. Can you please stand? Let us give you a, a South African welcome. <laughs> She's also a professor in the same league as uh, Professor Radaimani, so he decided to bring her today to have a taste of how we live as the people of Mzansi. Our next guest is known to all of us, especially on TV. <laughs> when he was the statistician of South Africa, I used to see him a lot there on TV. And that day, the whole and we both look at Rona, people of our color. We don't care about statistics, and I don't know how we are going to progress if we don't care about statistics. We don't care how many children we bring in the world. They will see how to finish. We don't plan what their future is going to be. If we have all these statistics that are not on that day, we have our two seats. Because all we care is that granted or not. But what after the grant? And then what's all it? I'm a mother of three. Eh? I have a 40 year plus. There are my two boys there, 35 and 32. Guys, I'm still mothering them. At that age, so you can imagine when they are five or 10 and with the high rate of unemployment we are having, that you must help us, can it? Let us blend in Totsarona. As I say, that Hotla doesn't need a lot of introduction, but yeah, it's my role to Titi kaba kaba, ya bo. Tini ni kama kaba nchinchi. Kya li wensa ya nungurki mo South Africa nin. Langa para sigana marikuamu. Ya. Ndate padili okotla has got so many qualifications. And uh, if I can go through the entire three or five pages, none of you will be able to go home today. So I'll just go through some of his qualifications. University of Ghana, where he did his population studies, which we know him about. National University of Lesotho, he did economics and stats. A college and university attended. A also Harvard Business School. University of Stellenbosch, where he did business. He has a lot of awards, honorary degrees 
uh, one in public service, another one in commerce, conferred by the University of Stellenbosch, an honorary doctorate of science, confirmed by the University of Natal. So as you can see, he studied more high. He studied in the continent in Ghana. He went overseas. One time I asked somebody in the shop, so where does this come from? He said, it comes from overseas. I said, where exactly? How? Oh, mama. Overseas, overseas, how? What <laughs> like So he studied overseas, overseas, yeah. Let me not waste any more time. Let me just invite you to mesmerize us, as Professor Zeblon did, about your part in addressing Bukhukubarona by unemployment in South Africa. Thank you, sir. Uh, no, uh, th thank you very much, Ambassador. And uh, as I came in, uh, I was very impressed by the young man I met. He said, we waited too long for you. <laughs> and uh, I tried to give several excuses. Uh, he was insistent. And I felt that we have a future. Uh, but uh, as it's, 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 it's uh, customary, I wasn't aware that uh, there would be an accident along the road. And as I took a, rock, a, a different turn, time started slipping by. And that is why I arrived late. The whole N1 was blocked. And I had to go towards Kruger stop and uh, took a detour. So my apologies for arriving late. Uh, but I, I got a tan lashing from a young man who was there to receive me. And I was very happy. I was unhappy about the, the tan lashing, but I was very happy about the firmness so that we can get things done in South Africa. Daddy, uh, you, you know we worked together during the census of uh, 96. The machine in a family that bought us CAT 66 years ago, those not yet born and to be born, students of Morris Isaacson High School, alumni of Morris Isaacson High School, and Ms. Lerato Tlalele, president, LRC president of Morris Isaacson High School, Ambassador Mji, Professor Zeblon Vilagasi, the organizing committee of CAT Machinini Memorial Lecture, the Soweto community, I acknowledge and greet you. The Bapedi have a, a saying to those not yet born and to be born that Hagaholo Sinamabala, Haifufa Insu, Mabala Analidi Haga. Success of a leader is not in herself or himself. Success is seen in their succession. This Sepedi idiom places the burden of trust on future generations. How those not yet born manage public affairs, that's the question, is what is the burden. My lecture embeds this Haga Holo philosophy as a principle and hope to guide us in our current as we reflect on our management of public affairs. For T.A.T. Machinini was a man of matters public progress, a man because his youth was stolen and he aged at meteoric, meteoric speed. He aged and passed on onto the next world, leaving a massive impact on South Africa. The question is how do we embrace this impact? T.A.T. Machinini would be exactly 66 years and five months today had he not perished in the far lands of Guinea in 1990 at the tender age of 33. Him and his young lions, his student comrades, a number gathered here, a number sleeping, the terminal sleep with him gazing over us, 
mobilize themselves in the most profound of formations, hitherto not witnessed anywhere in the world, where in 1976, at the age of 19, for TAT, but the average age came to 13, as the movement, as the movement engulfed all schools, and Hector Peterson lost his life at only 14 years old. They have shook the roots of apartheid, and not only to reset an irreversible path to freedom, but fundamentally accelerated it. They brought an indelible visibility to struggle. They juvenilized an Emma's presence of black South Africa internationally, and mostly densified their presence in the frontline states. To try to establish relevance of why I have been asked to speak today is perhaps of my coming from the mountain kingdom of Lesotho, which became in good part the epicenter of refugees, refugees of refuge and an intellectual home for the fleeing youth. Uh, Perhaps it is this line of connection that qualifies me to address this, the 10th annual CAT machine in lecture, or is it perhaps my long presence in South Africa and the rare privilege of being the mbongi of secrets of the lives of South African lives? Who we are, how we get born, how we live, work, play, and die has been my being an mbongi. The strange phenomenon of numbers is that, like Lembede and Biko before him, before Machinini, died at the same age as that of Lembede, who died in 1947, also aged 33 years, and Biko, who was assassinated a year later and perished at the age of 31. Lembede's comrades, who were at the formation of the Youth League, went on to live an age up to three times that of Lembede. These were Ndade Dentrome, 1919 to 1992, Ndade Oliver Tambo, 1917 to 1993, Ndade Ashley Munda, 1916 to 1993, Ndade Jordan Kush Ngubani, 1917 to 1995, Ndade Walter Sisulu, 1912 to 2003, Ndade David Bupape, 1915 to 2005, 204, Mele Ellen Kuzuayo, 1914 to 2006, Me Albertina Sisulu, 1918 to 2011, and Daddy Nelson Mandela, 1918 to 2013. They were able to keep the credo of freedom in a lifetime alive. Their dream that was set in motion in 1944, a year before the end of the Second World War, was waning. The might of the apartheid was at its highest with the historic inauguration of homeland authorities, with the independence of the TBV state. Tia Zimashinini and his comrades rekindled the hope and ensured that the path to freedom would be shortened to 14 years. In February 1990, Nelson Mandela was released from prison and political parties were unbanned. It was at this point that Tietzi Mazinini arrested. His mission was enjoined with that of Limbede in 1944, and freedom in their lifetime was accomplished. The question to those of us still alive is what are we doing with the political freedom that those who, whose life was short but impactful created for us? Let us consider the fact that, they, that a, a militant high school youth of 1976 who undoubtedly rekindled the spirit of ever overthrowing the colonial apartheid government would be on the average 65 years old of today that are gathered here. These youth were politically inspired by their creative revolutionary elder counterparts in the universities whose age would range between 70 and 75 on the average today. It must be heartbreaking for many of these men and women to look around the townships and their villages that were their battlefields and source of their early education to witness the extent of the social decay that is undergirded by economic exclusion, which ironically intensifies following, intensified following their apparent gain 
in political inclusiveness after 1994? Did the youth drop the ball, or was their struggle met with an almost fatal disruption, given the persistence of their and their community's economic exclusion about five decades later? Has the 1976 youth since been turn codes when followed in the path of the then colonial apartheid tolerant band to stand and back black uh, urban councillors, whom they regarded as lekis and outright, outright sellouts then. Any memorial lecture about CAC machinery cannot possibly be regarded as sound unless it makes an honest attempt to answer this and similar questions. My lecture today is not an attempt to answer these and similar questions. My lecture today is not geared towards any direct answers to these questions. Neither is it deliberately designed to skirt around them. My attempt to answer this simple but often avoided question, questions lies in the detail of what I have to say. Introduced in our lexicon immediately after June 1976 was the 1976 generation that 19, the 1976 generation as a lost generation. Today, as we sit and reflect, having six decades and more, we look very empty. Give a dog a bad name and hang him. You know, this uh, thing uh, is moving faster than I think. <laughs> In the process, seeing the destruction of education, we did not see the rekindling of the spirit and germination of freedom. Through such a lens of rekindling and germination of freedom would arise what do we do to education, what do we do to economy, what do we do to health, and what do we do to social life. This should be the questions inspired, imprinted in our minds as the reality of closure of schools and businesses the imminent disappearance of the next generation into far-flung lands requires a deeper plan. That would pose the question, what is it that we, the, 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 the Hakana do as beneficiaries of colorfulness that Haga Holo bestowed on us? Thirty-three years after the demise of Mashinini, Education in South Africa has deteriorated to levels worse than what machinery fought for. The state of our centers of learning have become hotbeds of drugs that destroy the future of children. The culture of teaching and learning has, fa has, fades, has faded fast, fastest. Riches and bling have replaced right thought and empathy that marked the lives of Soweto. In his book, I Am a Man, Jerry Mufuge Nwama had an erased life of the 60s in Soweto, and how, and how the elders took care of matters. That the Shebin became the center of learning, and how his mother's Shebin became a school of life for him. His rendition of the hard life that he led shows how Soweto elders were poised for victory over adversity, leading a purposeful life in a purposeless environment. The class of 1976, led by C.A.T. Machinini, led this purpose, purposeful life in a purposeful, purposeless environment. But alas, 30 years after his demise, the same issues he fought for emerged as the feast must fall, as the struggle for education continued in, 1916, in 2016. Our educational our educational policies lack the needed design that ensures that doors of learning are open. As an illustration, the efficiency and effectiveness index of black performance relative to white performance at university has deteriorated from a 1 to 1.2 for every white in the 70s. Would have graduated for every one black proportionate amongst black population that graduated, there would be 1.2 whites within that as a proportion of their population that would have graduated. This deteriorated in the 70s. This deteriorated to one for every black that graduates today, 
to six as a proportion of their population amongst whites 20 years into democracy. And the Fees Must Fall movement was an outcome of this deplorable deterioration. The proportions within, it in, within population group are such that for every black graduate, there were one to two white graduates proportionately in the 70s. And in the current, for every one black graduate, there are six white graduates graduating proportionately. And this reflects the rapid deterioration of cohort after cohort of black entrants into university education. This is not a reflection that blacks are stupid, but at the center is the utterly hopeless support systems uh, to blacks once they qualify to enter university. Be it bursary or living conditions at home. This is what Machinene fought for. We have become a crisis ridden country. Our memories of the oft repeatedly highlighted triple challenges of unemployment, poverty, and inequality have no sooner been now flooded with the replacement of the triple challenges by a new recent uh, triple challenge. And that triple challenge fed is labeled as energy, crime, and logistics, all wrought unto ourselves, by ourselves, and to which a crisis committee has now been formed uh, on Friday. The list of lamentable and monumental failures is too long, and most crucial and important is that of youth unemployment. The question is what would have CHC machine in done when, he faced with, when faced with this crisis? And given, given, given what seems CHC's cohorts would have understood, that freedom of, of, in our lifetime is a, require, a, a crucial requirement, they therefore planned in the details in the details, based on the impact they desired and defined. They knew that their actions would speed up the pace towards freedom, and, did, and indeed, within 14 years, they had brought apartheid to the negotiation tables. Political prisoners were released in 1990, and the path to freedom was set, culminating in democracy in 1994. I would plan in the detail, but knowing the situation where South Africa can plan in systems are back, or that are back of the envelope calculations, I would implore robust tools of foresight and future proof that capture the loss of emotions, capture the loss of motion of economics and they embed them as the guiding light. Fortunately, this exercise has been undertaken that I'm talking about has been undertaken already under the Indula Meti scenarios, South Africa 2030, through applied development research solutions, which showed that a different path is possible in the country, one that can reduce unemployment, grow the economy, and get better outcomes in social cohesion. But sadly, this is ignored by government policy regime. Secondly, we have to realize, we have to realize the coal energy systems uh, the coal energy systems of electricity excluded the blacks. The nuclear energy systems not only excluded the blacks, but on the eve of democracy, this capability was snatched out of South Africa, and the new government also allowed it. To our shores have emerged new energy systems, thanks to one, thanks to one of the class of 1976, a Mojale from Ituato. He now, uh, his home is in, in, in uh, Orange Farm but he's based in Toronto. He has been searching and found Dr. Professor Maizetsenko, whose energy system called M-Cycle is named after Maizetsenko, who, who is bringing this new civilization. South Africa dare not lose out on this frontier energy based on Tesla, Tesla that there is free energy in the air. Deploying indirect evaporative cooling to below wet bulb to dew point unleashes New unleashes, unleashes freely available energy to the globe. The core difference is that the possibility of this being in South Africa is nigh. This will change the education system to more empowering energy, to more empowering 
will create the space for new and massified real jobs and jobs for the future. The convergence of this technology that unleashes abundance energy combined with information technology that has demonstrated that data is, not, is non-rival ultimately defy the laws of scarcity but unleashes the laws of preponderance. Central, let us remember science needs empathy. Our today's politics lack empathy. Machinini led with empathy, and that is why his 33 years of life have been so impactful. What we need is not the so tired theory of political will. Let us remember those who lack empathy cannot, out of nowhere, imbue political will. The parent of political will is empathy. Do not expect those who lack this property of empathy to give you what they do not have. Everyone dispenses what they have. They can only grant what they have. Limbede had men and women of principle who imbued empathy and kept the promise alive. Bigo imbued empathy and Machinini exuded empathy. They have all shown that short lives, regret regrettable to us as family and society as this can be, does not mean short-changed lives. Because in them we can read empathy of our politics. We can, because in them we can read empathy uh, that our politics must be driven by science because it is a subject steeped in empathy. These short-lived stalwarts are the Classical Bapedi Haga Holosena Mabal, Haifufa Yunsu, Mabala Analdi Hagan. This is CHT Machinini's message to us today. Thank you very much. Science needs empathy. Political will needs empathy. I've never heard of that, but it sounds like something I've always known. Let's give him another round of applause. Please. I'm going to do what all program directors do. Hmm? Um, there is a, a deterioration in the appreciation of African languages in our country. And a lot of the young people think that it's going to make them better. You see this thing about empathy. And then you even lack expressions that are unique, like the ones then that they padi lo hotan zatla kasona are kasi pedi hotui hotui hotui. What do you think you're going to become as a human being in life? Utlaba yona tamati sos. Utlaba tama rotsela everywhere the chipsi. Because you will not be rooted anyway. The biggest contribution of Nelson Mandela did not come from him being a lawyer. It came from his upbringing. Whichever of the two. When he was sitting in the royal crawl, Amamiti, uh, the royal family, explaining how disputes are, 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 are discussed by the royal family. And he grew up with that. And as he grew up, he included it, he integrated it into his whole being. 
and the Ubuntu that went with it and so on. Now we think that regularly radarless roots and then we can bring something into our society. No, it doesn't work like that. When I went to Morris Isaacson in 1974, it's because Nekishali Sut, Moniki Kenna School of Things and Agnes. And my father was living in Deben, which meant Kisoneziki Tutesizu. Kahana Kar. So we too, Hunali to Golo Ze Rudangsi Sut. That's why how I came to Morris. And it was our culture, our empathy from our culture the love of our people that made us the people that we became. So what they are removing our languages, they are also removing our culture. And once they remove our culture, we are going to be rudderless, we are going to be without roots, we are not going to know who we are, and all we'll care about, I mean, what can money do for you? How far can money take you? It can only take you this far. It can create this empathy. It can create family. It can create community. It can create society. So, na, kiliskos MG, otolwanki makos, abuan sisutu. The problem in Aruna is unemployment. Why do we have unemployment when we have 11 official languages? Why don't we learn our languages? And then we have interpreters and translators in parliament, in government, but we have a lot of people who are so on. Why do we have a lot of people who are when the Germans rebuilt their country, they did it in German, in their own country. Bakala di company tse na tse di kolo itse ntle tse na tse ri di rata ng runa lo bocho mo tse mo rock. Ruale utai utai plana joa unkoloi osa ukui sisi puo e o ituda ngayon. Look at look at those children who used to make those eh eh kolo itse di rata in the location. Where did they go to school? In the family. So, I took advantage of the program director. I took advantage of the program director. Let's write it, let's read it. Let's write it, let's read it. Let's make sure our own country, in government, you get the form. So that everybody can have access to that information. All the time, and in the process, we cheat them. See that lady who asks you at the bank, then you just tell them half of the information. Where is the dignity? Where is the dignity? So, our languages are important because they are vehicles of our culture. The American language is the vehicle of that culture, yeah, the hot dogs. <laughs> and uh, that thing ends like Michael Jackson. That's what that culture is about. In our own cultures that promote many things, including the rare things such as empathy. Really, I thank you for that empathy. Science goes with empathy. We have a professor here who's from Witz, who is in the science angle, but literally empathy high from his speech. He, you could tell that he knows what's happening in the community and he cares about what's happening in the community because, as Ndate Padilo Hotla says, science must also go with empathy. Ralebo and now I come to a, a time when I'm going to ask Renali a roving mic. Yes, Aha, Tato, you're going to help me. Yes, Kialebo, How many minutes? I like to be guided. I to put you out here to a mono. First 
So Ratlanka, three questions at a time. Somebody will be keeping the time for us. The first three questions. I get a wenan that they were Mike Utabe, yeah, Utabo Itzamais. So the floor is yours. Question number two, so that we have three at a time so we don't waste time. Okay, good go ahead. Good afternoon uh, to everyone and all protocol observed. And I feel that Entertainment uh, Hotel can't just escape like that. And I want to ask this question coming from Soweto, knowing that in Soweto we carry this country with similar townships like Bo, Gatlehong, Davidson, all the townships that were under apartheid directly when other people were in homelands enjoying apartheid benefits. But today, Sowetans are excluded from economy. And now, with Badilu Hotla saying, I understand that now we're talking free trade, that you must open borders and all that. So now, most people are not working in South Africa. Their jobs have been taken by people who did not struggle with us. People who came here, we had their own PEE, we had their own freedom, they messed up their own countries. Dr. Badi Luhutla is a statistician. Somebody can do that job with a junior degree in South Africa. You don't need to be a doctor to do that. Coming from the Sutu, taking that job, how does it feel when people from the Sutu coming here, taking jobs, knowing that they mistreated our people? Ambassador here, probably was staying in a camp. He was not gallivanting freely like foreigners we see today. They are doing all sorts of businesses that they are not supposed to do. They are not scarce skills. They are not coming here to be nuclear physicists. They are selling potatoes. They are doing exactly what we were doing before, the spaza shops. What's so rare about spaza shops? Hairstyling, you know. So the, the question is that. She say, he says, what's the question? How does it feel? You know, is it fair for people to come from foreign states or foreign countries to come and take jobs that are here, housing, beds, hospital beds? Today, when my electricity has been closed in Soweto, I go to the city of Joburg. There's somebody who's negotiating with me, is a Zimbabwean. Is that fair? Thanks, thanks, okay. uh, I think your point has been made. Uh, let's stick to asking questions. Um, oh, my name is Nula Madlamini. I'd like to, um, as we've been asked, go straight to the question. Uh, Guprof Zevlon um, Vilagazi, um, as the Vice Chancellor of uh, Wits University, you, where you produce degrees. Um, you speak and tell us that you don't really need a degree to pretty much make it in life. And there's a huge context behind that. Um, I watched you walking from where you seated, um, Prof, to make your speech, a few steps with so much vigor and zest for life. You walked back similarly so, and you addressed the young people um, and spoke a lot to them about entrepreneurship. I know it's, it's not quite part of the topic. I'd like to, um, for you, to please um, express the importance of that wellness. I think you did somehow touch, touch on it. At 50, 54 years old, you, you, you walk with so much vigor, as I said, and as an entrepreneur, there's a lot um, that the young people will need to know about as part of their wellness. So it's more of a statement, but also a question and a comment. Thank you. Question is straightforward in terms of curriculum delivery. When can we change this toxic curriculum that we are teaching our children and convert it to what we hear here today of the speech that has been said? Because this language and the topics that we're talking about, if our children can be taught exactly that, they will understand exactly where we want to go. The second question is, I, I appreciate these talks, I appreciate this podium, I appreciate this engagement. But I think we need more of our children who are in school to hear this more, because with us, it's over. You said we, we are the past and there's a future. So we speak to the future in all this concept that we about. Those are only two things that I need to know. Thanks. Hotla to answer 
followed by John. Uh, the first question, very, very direct, uh, but difficult as well, uh, as to, to a person who comes from Lesotho. <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, the, the, the question is, is very valid. Because I worked in the Department of Labor in Lesotho. And uh, when we worked in that Department of Labor, there were a number of conditions that we are talking about. A person who would get a work permit would be one who has rare qualifications that the Lesotho do not have. But assigned to that would be a number of other of local people who should take over from that person who comes from elsewhere. And then the training was directed, and the measurement was very clear. So that, that dealt with the issue around how you deal with rare skills. There is a second issue around it that. Uh, Oftentimes, people come because in their own countries there are difficulties. Just as South Africa had difficulties, and a number of people had to be in the suit. Um, they, they, they didn't stay in camps. People stayed with the Mushafa philosophy of the suit being a, a sanctuary of many other people prevailed. But it is also true that people elsewhere stayed in camps. The question that is being asked is really around how do we manage immigration in the different areas of skill? In 1976, we studied with a number of people from South Africa. Their parents had businesses here a shop, a butchery, a milk shop, all those things were there. And it was on the basis of that strength that they could actually go to school. But all those businesses no longer belong to the people of Soweto. And they're therefore, that's a legitimate question as to how does this economy become inclusive when it excludes Soweto. Something is terribly wrong in our policy architecture. And it has to be fixed. It's a difficult or rather a, a rather challenging uh, program to address that. Because at times, the community gets not irritated, but certainly uneasy about what they see. and at times erupts into attacks with the people that we are communing with. That is an issue that cannot be left on its own. There is a policy space where the government really is failing and pities, pits locals against foreigners. And then the environment is becoming absolutely impossible to govern. This certainly is something that has to be dealt with, and it needs action that is directed. There is no reason why there is not 
an implementation of an employment policy of shadowing whoever is coming from outside. I started in Bukhtuazona myself when I worked. And when I got there, I said, no, I'm not going to die in this position. I have to create many more people that will replace me, that are local. And when I left Mafijeng and came to Pretoria, my space was taken by a local. When I was in office for 17 years, in 1996, when we recruited the person who is now the statistician general, in that interview, I said to the colleagues, uh, Mark Walken, I said, we have a future statistician general here. I still knew that I still have to have my, my number of years, which I started in 2000. And for 17 years, I was statistician general. You cannot leave succession to chance. You can't. If you do that, you'll get all kinds of wrong things happening. Especially to key positions that require a nationals. I acquired South African citizenship in 1993, having stayed in Bupu for almost uh, a number of years. Why I ended up there is a, a story of another day. I was running away from the suit coming into an apartheid system. So there are many dynamics in the space that we have to deal with, but we have to confront those things. But thank you very much for asking that, that question. On the question of curricula, uh, indeed curricula has to, to change. I was very happy, Professor Filakasi, that we talked about uh, AMBA. Uh, when I finished matric, uh, I, I had a scholarship to India to go and do civil engineering. But I had to start at Fogoti in Lesotho for a year to go and, uh, you know, there was even an allowance of 180 rand a month in 1976. It was a lot of money. But then uh, I had an admission also at the University of Lesotho. So there was an evening I went there, and then there was a very nice discotheque. <laughs> and I never left the National University of the Sud. I often ask myself whether I made the right choice or I didn't. <laughs> but thank you very much. <laughs> And I think I'll also uh, I'll be very brief in responding, responding to these questions. I'm a fast talker, as you can tell. Um, I said the last one on uh, Viga. I don't know whether that still happens here. Uh, from, you know, we had physical education at schools. Uh, my competition, you know, Seresisa, uh, with other schools, Fumana versus Kakula, uh, football, martial arts classes were formed. My brother is here who is a brown belt in karate, you know. So there was a culture of vigorous physical activity that led to a healthy mind. I walk around in my hometown, Sprite, uh, see that, you know, the school where there was a, um, a ground, you call it a ground, you know, a netball, baseball, and so on, and softball, net. Uh, I asked whether, you know, grass is growing, and I asked um, my nephew oh, that, uh, do we still have competitions where schools competed in athletics, Zilch. And therein lies the problem. Uh, this, you see kids who are like, you know, uh, who look even my age now for reasons that you know about this uh, poison that has, infect, that has entered our community. I see kids who, um, who, um, who um, you know, could be my children. Uh, you know, 
and that's a promise. Actually, it's hard. I mean, we are destroying ourselves. I think that we need, I mean, we need political will without this empathy to solve it, which is why it's 54. Well, I don't know. Looks, looks can be deceiving, but I move on. Um, my brother here asked a question that, okay, you know, it's not a zero-sum game. I understand. I've seen uh, that there's a lot of local entrepreneurship that has been wiped out. That our local, those business people that own garages that, you know, became our role models and actually they gave bursaries because they come from that community and no longer there and there's a problem. However, on a much larger scale as well, we are part of a connected world. As much as we import technology, import cars, you know, there will be people import because human migration is part of who we are as human beings. I mean, all of us left Africa and they evolved to something else and formed different races because human migration is part of us. And in my space where I work, and I lose your country, Prof. America, the strength of a nation is in its ability to attract people. Obviously, there has to be control. Uh, at my university where I work, we have professors who come from abroad. They bring in skills. They educate our students. In fact, uh, I was mentored by a Belgian scientist who came here, opened up doors for me. So therefore, we are part of a global knowledge. I mean, you cannot live in a cave. You know, there was a famous story of a Greek writer called Plato who said that people were stuck in a cave. They were too scared of the world. And they only saw the world in terms of uh, the reality, the tunes that you're projecting. And they were stuck there. When they were released from the cave, they were shocked to see that there's a human being who's in three dimensions. So we can't be stuck in a cave. I'm using the story of a cave that we need to be part of a real world, but there has to be law and order, there has to be control. We are part of a, it's not, a, it's not either or, but I hear you in passion. I feel some of the uh, crisis I feel whenever I go to my hometown, but I think you cannot also be stuck in a cave. On the one on, one on curriculum, I mean, that the has answered, is that, um, again, it's the same question, right? That, yes, we need to localize the curriculum, but, you know, if you localize the curriculum, also take into account the fact that you import technology. Our children must understand the world of uh, open AI, this uh, generative uh, artificial intelligence, ChatGPT, which is moving very fast. And how do we do that? I mean, you are caught in between the two extremes here. Uh, it's like trying to fix an engine uh, while the airplane is in motion. So I hear you. This is what we feel, but the reality is that the world of tech, which is even for Germans is in English. Uh, when I was in France in 1994, uh, everyone spoke French at varsity until even they did their PhDs, and now they're changing to English. The French are, realize, are realizing that they're losing out on this digital exponential, which is in English. So that's why we find ourselves. You see, that is, uh, and we, our priority is, is to catch up, Chief. We can't, you know, we have to catch up. If we don't catch up, we become slaves. Uh, if those that are behind technologically are dead, he who controls AI will rule the world and we'll be in the backwaters of this world if we do not catch up now. And that is my priority number one, as an educator, as a scientist, and as an instructor, as a, as a leader of a university. That's always been my kind of like clarion call and passion. So my answer is not what you wanted, but you know, it's what I believe at least. Thank you. <laughs> And uh, while you are searching for the mic, I also have a sixpence. Um, about uh, the question here, Abuti Aik. Abuti Aik, I also have something to share. Uh, I think it's easy when you live in Soweto to say Soweto liberated the country. But no, 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 but when you live in Mtanzani and you live in a, I don't know, and so on and so on. And this is the sad thing about our history not being told. Because when the history is not being told and is not being uh, written and shared, especially to the general population, then every one of us has their own uh, understanding of just that part, you know, where they were. There were people who were killed in, in the Bantu stands, who were against the Bantu stand system. So I just want to share that from a distance, it looks like, you know, only people here suffered. But coming to the other question, your control, 
Our government has failed us in terms of controlling how people move into this country. It's got nothing to do with us having lived outside because when we were living outside, we were controlled. There were controls not even by the government there, by our own people who said, you are not allowed to go there, you are not allowed to... And the countries had policies also about skills and who works with what kind of... You, you studied at their university, but they wouldn't employ you because they said, you are not a Zimbabwean, you are not a, you are not a Zambian. So those were the rules, but we, we've just decided, you know, sends a good began. Yeah, we didn't sell drugs. How could we? I guess I'm telling you that we had controlled. That's what I'm explaining. We were controlled by our own liberation movements. But we come home and there's no control. Exactly. That is where the problem is. And everybody knows there's no control. So they come willy nilly. <laughs> Thank you, Program Director. I've taken home the question of empathy and mm. political will. I've made an observation in this country, probably most of you are drivers, because I want to ask a question. With so many drivers in South Africa, twice South Africa has had a machine printing the driver's license cards breaking down. Mm. And each time it breaks down, the country waits for repair that must be taken to Germany and then come back. In the interim, when the machine is not sorted out yet, the country waits. The reflection I'm trying to ask here, what goes on in the state of the mind of a country that has twice experienced such a thing, and it happens, that they have a citizens who drive, who are complied to get driver's licenses, but when the machine breaks down, Germany is the answer in 2023. Greetings uh, to everybody, all protocol of Zen. Hello, my surname is Khatebe. Uh, I was impressed about the sister or program director who was speaking about our own languages. We, we seem to, you know, whilst our languages are like Swabigele so Saitin. Uh, that is also what is worrying me, as you have said. This is just a comment for now, uh, ma'am. Uh, I want to ask about Mr. Lee Hutler, who was a statistician. Lama Kama Lama Kulu Doctor. Statistician. General. And uh, you were in a platform of influence. We saw you on TV whilst you were in that position. There were no changes that you've made. You were also talking about unemployed youth and all those things. Whilst there were no changes. I was impressed with the professor who was talking about um, in those days. I was 14 years in, in June 16. We had what we call imkirikach. So it, where you, I was doing standard five, where we're taking a bus, a CSA and Ninth field, where we were trained, you choose whatever trade that you want to go to. I choose uh, woodwork, but I realize with I, then I choose a uh, bricklaying. So since we've got people here advocates, learned people, academic people, people of influence. 
Can't we influence those people in the, in the government to bring back those things where learners will be sent to those places so that they learn the skill? Because today they talk about skill. You know, which is me I now, mean, I'm just a police officer. I can't even fix or put a brick or I know nothing. All what I know is to arrest people. That's all what I know. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Prof. Ntatele uh, Hosa, I'm inclined to protect you on this one. From us who have observed you work over the years, uh, you managed your mandate very well. So I am protecting you from responding to those utterances that have no bearing on your work that you did and your mandate. But of course, being the gentleman that you are, you may want to respond to that question. Um, we have a question from the lady that side. Thank you. Oh, this one. Yes. Greetings to everyone and all protocol observed. My name is Mamsi Mashinini. So, to the academics, I own a company and I love creating jobs. But there's a problem. I want to be too, they come out of the university. It's so painful. They would submit their CVs, submit their academic records. What they do in our universities, it's painful. I'm not sure what is it that you can do in order to change the curriculum yes, in my universities to suit our job a corner or economy as South Africa. So, and then on this one, my language is footy uh, ambassador. Angege abantu bawazi our own languages because the teachers who are teaching African languages today, they don't know it. Teachers who are teaching isizulu abasazi isizulu because in some universities they are taught by whites. Ama whites afundi isizulu. So how can someone teach you your own language? The Zulu that we learned it in Namaskula, it's far different from the Zulu Samanj. Abaz nishi zishu shabuti shabana mtlanj. Abaz has. And the home language is a prerequisite for Mdwana to pass. And they fail. What is it that can be done in order to rectify all this? Ule e, ule ira espila guyu. I'm going to hand over to you, the two gentlemen, to respond to the quick three questions. Yes, uh, I'm the one who's got the pressure of time, so I'll have to leave shortly. Um, that one, that was asked by the officer. You know, and I'll defend, I'm not defending, but as a citizen, I used to read the statistics that come from the uh, general to Hollywood, and I think the statistics of South Africa under his leadership was second to none in the world. His job is not to create jobs. His job is to tell you. His job is to look at the data, information, collect it, and say, here's a story. Government implement. His mind is limited. Like, the job of a university is not to create jobs, it's to educate. Are we educating properly or not? That's the question. And that comes to uh, Mrs. Mums' question at the back about, you know, the, the prepared, preparedness. We are, we, are, we are changing our curriculum, as I mentioned, that you've got these new technologies that are coming through. However, I have to say that we do our surveys, vets, uh, maybe it's vets, I'm not speaking for other universities, 96% um, of people who qualified vets get jobs within the first six months of, that, of, the, of qualifying. So it's 96%, right? They get snapped up by Investec, whatever, whatever, whatever. So that is maybe the privilege of being versus history. It's a particular privilege here, which I think I'm aware of. And it speaks for 
only 5,000 students who get into the first year. Maybe other universities don't address that, but there's a history, networks, connections, and so on and so forth. So therefore, uh, yes, also despite that, uh, Osmamsi, graduates from whatever university that have a degree or whatever qualification or diploma or whatever have unemployment which is five times less than those who have never had tertiary education. So you can tell that statistically, <laughs> the, your chance of having employability at the age of 20, 21, whenever you finish, is five times less, sorry, of not being unemployed, is five times less than had you not taken that opportunity, which is a huge number. So I think let's not also paralyze ourselves with, like, you know, uh, we actually think positive because if we allow ourselves to be overwhelmed by negativity, we actually only see gloom and doom and we all kind of get paralyzed and we lose hope. And hope leads to misery and misery leads to people believing in false prophets. So we need to keep our, eye, our, our, our heads up and say, you got a problem, but let's not let our problems paralyze us and repeating these whole, whole stories again. I think we need to be... But you can pick the last one, and I have to take off. I'm so sorry. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm a slave of time. <laughs> I'm controlled by time. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. 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 Yeah. Um, um, how many more questions are we having? Uh, it will depend how long that Delhosa will stay, especially since he was a bit late. So I think he'll be able to indulge us. Uh, critically, my colleague will kill me if I don't mention this. On the question of language and teaching in our own language, there's a lecture that we did in 2019. Yeah, Professor Chilisi Marwala, Professor Pakeng. It's on YouTube. You go there on YouTube and you'll get all the information, some of the questions answered on teaching uh, the subjects in our own language. Thank you. Um, did you take this lady's hand? She's been... Before, be Professor Villagas, you want to go through that process now? Yes. Okay. Oh, so the questions are closed now? Not yet. Uh -huh. Not yet. Um, we'll come to that questions again. Oh, God, what's Mine up? is not a very easy job. The looks that you give me, I'm immune to. I've been doing this for years. So, I go through proportionally. The statistician general will uh, assess me on whether I'm doing it properly. Just our small gesture of appreciation, uh, Dr. Vilagazi. <laughs> the uniform here at the school <laughs> is Oglingana, exactly. <laughs> so that's the, from now on, that's how you can make commemorate June 76, Uko uniform like some grown-ups do on the day. Thank you. Let's hope he's going to be like Gashabu Teles. You know, he always wears that brazer or forte. Pre precisely. <laughs> okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to be very strict on the topic, ne? Uh, we can ask questions raised by, on the discussion by uh, Dr. Vilagasi. Ndatelo Husa will see how far he may go to, in terms of asking them. I need to see two hands from here. Sipo, I'm not going to take your hand because you are my friend. It's not going to happen. Not today. Um, I'm going to take two hands from here and one hand from that side. Yes, you say I'm going to take your hand. I'm going to start with the lady here. Thank you. My name is Tandega Mamgwev. So um, this is for the academics and I suppose people who would have an idea of how to fit in the missing middle. Missing middle is usually referred to as people with regards to their income. Now in my world, missing middle is also the population who have either been retrenched or for whatever reason have become unemployed and now they are not young enough to qualify for NSFAS and they have so many years of experience to give back whether it's in corporate or NGOs etc. How do those people become employable again because we are living in a society of ageism 
where one, I'm, I'm actually one of those people. We're living in a society of ageism. We're living in a society that says you are too expensive to be hired. The reason is purely because you do not have that degree that we're looking for that the younger ones have and as a result they are cheaper to be hired because they are they don't have the experience how do we fix that issue of the missing middle thank you so much my sister. thank you great question greetings to everyone uh, my name is tumelo i reside here in white city jababu um, I acknowledge the fact that uh, you raised a, um, this issue of iambar. Uh, to us people, bala is a way to, it becomes a challenge for us because we do have artisan skills. But there's a visible red tape for us in terms of employment. Uh, you'd find uh, some cases that uh, the policy on its own, it doesn't have a geographical control because we feel people from Soweto that uh, it favors uh, people from certain provinces and it doesn't benefit us. So it becomes a challenge in terms of uh, having the, 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 the eat to even uh, learn artisan skills because what's the point of learning artisan skills where else you won't get any employment? Uh, em employment favors uh, people, mainly the issue we're having now. We feel that people from Polokwan are benefiting more from artisan skills, of which uh, it doesn't benefit us. So what's the plan to of missing middle, both missing middle in the form of not in education and not in employment, but also missing middle in terms of um, those who have not as yet retired, but uh, they all reached retirement age uh, and have skills, but uh, the problem is ageism, uh, which is uh, there. 
the, the key issue, I think, in our system that we should really begin to address. And uh, when I was statistician general, I, I started appealing to my colleagues who were directors general that uh, I'm tired of producing these numbers. I'm tired of measuring Kilimanjaro and nothing is changing on the height of Kilimanjaro. Unemployment is the same and absolutely there's, there's nothing that looks like a response to what we are seeing. Um, fundamentally, there are things that are wrong in our policy space. And we need to deal with that fundamental problem. When we look at uh, the Africaners and their uh, AMBAH, the AMBAH was connected to ESCOM, was connected to uh, uh, meet, uh, ESCO, was connected. So this infrastructure, this infrastructure of SOEs was the way that the government was interfacing with business. At the moment, our politics are just a briefcase. There is no infrastructure that is state-owned, that connects with business. So these gaps are fundamentally caused by that problem. And then tenders. So with that culture of tenderpreneurship, it has killed this fundamental interface of privatization is the biggest problem that we have. So even private education. So those who can afford will privatize and seclude themselves and leave everybody else. So it's, 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 a, it's a major problem that, that, that we have that is fundamental. So in the policy design, there is this problem, and we are not going to get out of it until we shift our policy design such that one of the things that was very uh, painful in government has been this outsourcing of uh, cleaner, cleaning services, of drivers, of this and all that. So as a director general, having been appointed, you are removed from the task at hand which is dealing with poverty, inequality, and unemployment. When you have cleaners and drivers and, 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 and uh, people who guard the environment, they are in your face as the director general, and they are your conscience. If you outsource that to somebody else, the conscience of government is killed, is dead. I refused to accept that in my office for a long period of time, because I took it that my conscience are these people that are cleaners that I see every day. I have to understand where their children go to school, the drivers and everybody. And then started a program of saying, even if you're a driver, you'll go to school. Now, if we outsource that fundamental thing that we have been fighting on, then we are likely not to achieve the goals we want to achieve. So. At the heart of our problem is what did we sign up for? For liberation. The hands have come home to roost with high unemployment, high inequality, high levels of poverty, and then the ravaging of the infrastructure like uh, cables, roads, all these things, and of course the social fiber. And then we cry, we want to see a social compact. There are no mechanisms of advancing social compact under those circumstances. Those are alien to Ubuntu completely. Coming to the issue of universities, the government is pitying society against universities. We have a national agenda of nation building. Now, I want to raise an important statistic 
that as South Africa, we seem not, or we keep our eyes close to it. 62% of fathers say they are married against 38% of mothers. Now, that's a very important statistic. That should inform every other government policy. I've tried to put that statistic in front of all the policymakers as this. If we don't take care of this statistic, we are in serious trouble and we are not going to resolve the problems. Now, 62% of mothers, of fathers, say they are married against 38% of mothers. Now, unless these mothers are polyandrous, then it is a, a difficult problem. Now, so, now, so every mother has two husbands. Yes. Uh, in, in West Africa, it was that way. In Ghana, uh, they, they are polygenderous. Uh, so a woman marries a number of husbands. But in South Africa, we know that we are polygamous. Our president, Msholozi, uh, has many wives. Now, here is the issue. When it comes to what CAC and others were fighting for. Not only refusing to be taught in Africans, but ensuring that they get quality education. That quality education that we, of these 1.2 million children that are born every year, our constitution and our laws say that uh, basic education is a, a right. And basic education ends in metric, 10 years of schooling or whatever it is. Year in, year out, 800,000 of these children don't make it to metric. Now, there's a fundamental problem there, that there is a promise, but this promise is failed every year. And when the Minister of Education and the President come and talk about results, they say there is an improvement in the results. I, I said, well, congratulate those who have passed. Don't say there is an improvement in the results. The results have long stayed flat, absolutely flat, year in, year out. And we are producing 800,000 student children that actually have to roam the streets. That's the problem. Now, in that problem, then, we have 40 years after CAC and them led a revolution as students of Fees Must Fall. The Fees Must Fall was about Fees Must Fall. They didn't say Fees Must Fall for the poor or for the rich. They said Fees Must Fall. We have a, an agenda for nation building. And students are united in saying Fees Must Fall. Government decided to go and nitpick and pay for the poor. When you do that, you divide the national agenda of students and make students for the rich and students for the poor. The evidence that the professor is talking about here is in 2014, 5% of those who had degrees, uh, five, only 5% of those who had degrees were unemployed, which is not even five times, but almost seven, eight times lower than those who do not have degrees. So by ensuring that you pay for everybody, you are increasing the base of people who are intellectually equipped to deal with many issues in the country. But because you have been nitpicking around this issue, Today, that number has doubled to 10%. Now, I want to get back to the issue of 68%, 62% of fathers saying they are married against 38% of mothers. And the issue here, when I made my submission to the Care Commission, was pay for everyone. First, 
because there is a national agenda of nation building. Tax everyone who is earning enough or more so that education, so that the students are students and they have a student agenda as expressed in FISMAS 4. Once you start nitpicking as you do, the students who will always strike are the students from poor families because the money is not enough. They have to support families somewhere else and so on and so on. Now they started saying, well, we look at the, fam the, 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 the income of the, of the, of the, of the, of the parents. Uh, now, they come to look at the income of the parents where only 38% of the mothers say they are married. It means the husband has long been sent away. Now, you subject that child to the ravages of what is happening in the split responsibility of those parents. You also subject the, the woman to the vagaries of this man. And when you do that, you cannot stop gender-based violence. And all these things are connected and our inability to understand what statistics say is a fundamental. These numbers are telling a tale of how we have to deal with our past and how we have to deal with how we encourage the future. But uh, unfortunately, Lenin, as he says, in 1920, addressing the Bolsheviks, he said there are three enemies. The first enemy is communist conceit, which is pomposity and verboseness, and uh, you know, marching and saying, I'm a communist, without delivering anything. That was 1920. The second is illiteracy. And illiteracy, he says that an illiterate person, that is a person who cannot conceive, who cannot understand, doesn't politics live outside him. That person lives outside, outside politics. And the third is bribery. And where there is bribery, any form of, con of control and anything doesn't work. That's where we are in this country. Our politicians are illiterate, and the bureaucrats are not helping them in making them literate. So we are in that state where we cannot crunch the evidence to show us where the fault lines are. And instead, we have to dis dis explain things that are difficult away. Haman Skral has to be explained away. Everything has to be explained away. The potholes have to be explained away. You see, comrade, uh, this thing uh, of the potholes, uh, let me explain to you, chief. <laughs> now, when we don't work with facts, we cannot confront the things that confront us. This is the central problem that we are facing in the country. We don't have tools of foresight. We don't have future proof. And when we don't have that, even when the president rises or the minister of finance rises, they talk about the inputs, which is the money that is being poured into the system. They don't talk about impact. The president, when he rises, must talk about impact, not an input. Because when we start talking about input, the comrades start saying, what is my bread in that billion and that billion and that billion? But when you talk about impact and say South African children will pass at the rate of 90% and will eliminate the 1.2 million, 800,000 that fail to reach metric, we'll reduce that number to only 200,000. Nobody can go and steal that. But when you say we'll spend so much money, they're already lining up tenders. Our language creates conditions for this situation we are in. So unless we start addressing our political our policies, this thing is going to be with us for a very long time. It is etched in empathy, as C.S. Machinini, Nelson Mandela, and all these people were, they had empathy. And when we have empathy, 
the reason of making the wrong decisions, or rather the corrupt decisions, is very reduced. Even if you make wrong decisions, when you have empathy, those wrong decisions can always be corrected. So this is the problem, this is the story of South Africa, that at the very beginning, it's difficult at the family level. And our policies tend to be absolutely unaware of this, and we start pitting society itself, and the society tears itself apart. And the government said we didn't cause it. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Dr. Lohosa. Um, I have been given clear instructions right now to hand over to our esteemed Masters of Ceremonies. M Madam Program Director, mm. it's over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We just want to ask at least two learners to ask some questions. We can't come to Maurice Isaacson and no learner asked us Baholo, you know, wanting to know one or two things. And then thereafter, we will go to the next item, which is handing over of presents. Learners, a boy and a girl. You know what? We mustn't suppress the boy child. We shouldn't promote the girls in such a way that Bashimani Bataba we should strive for balance. Yeah, a boy and a girl. Where are the boys, Sir Maurice? Uh, Madam, uh, Madam Program Director, mm. they have chickened out. Who have chickened out? The boys. Oh. Yes, uh, and, and, and you know, as a result, there is a question that side. From a boy. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Okay, no problem. If they are not here, there's nothing we can do. Mm. Let's start that side. She happens to be the PRO of the NRC. Hey, the acronym is a PRO. Public Relation Officer. Yeah, Rebel. Yeah. Um, good day, I know, everyone. I know. I'm always Mbata, best known as Fifi. I'm the PRO of the school which is public relation officer. Um, my, my question today is about, I had um, say saying um, he once asked that um, they should text everyone even higher for education to be paid. In lower, lower level of education, I can see that um, there's progress Whereas um, the, we get free education, free books, and free test books. But when we get to universities, some learners can achieve that goals to, um, to reach the point score that they want so that we can get access to universities. Um, and it becomes a problem because of the households that we come from. Our parents can provide for every learner in the house. It becomes hard for us to achieve the goals that we want to achieve. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, you should come to the question now. Yes. My question is, mm -hmm. um, is the government going to be able to provide for learners who can reach the point score that they want? Or is the government not going to do anything about that? That's my mm -hmm. question. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the other question? There's only one mic. Oh, OK. Good day, everyone. I go by the name of Stella Manamela, and I am the deputy president of Maurice Isaacson's. So this is my statement. With unemployment rate increase rapidly, and there are a lot of graduates in the country of which are still unemployed. There is my question. Which fields of work should students study f uh, for to abate our economy? Yes, the last question. 
to you all. Uh, my name is Babala November, and I'm the RCL of Grade 11A. Um, so my question is, in the past, um, specifically during apartheid, did you have problems um, such as unemployment, etc., and you, you, fixed, uh, you fixed those problems only to find out that they are creating more problems? <laughs> what is the question? In the past, uh, during apartheid, uh, did you have problems like unemployment, etc., only to fix them, but they are creating more problems? Yes, I get you. I get you. Yeah. I can answer this one. Yeah, apartheid. I can really move off it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, my daughter or my granddaughter. There are problems in life that will always be there, right? Even in the Bible, Jesus says, the poor you'll always have amongst you. Our problem, our problem in this country is the extent of our problems. The way we let our problems become so huge that they end up on their own creating other problems. And I think uh, that uh, the statistics, when he said, so they say 62% of men are married, but the women say 38% are married. And then he says, we have this free education, 1.2 uh, children entering school. Now, 800,000 do not qualify. So how, how will you solve that problem? So our problems, are similar, not identical to our party, but they have quadrupled, if you like. They have increased tenfold. And my question is one question that hasn't been asked right now. You talked about policy. Of course, we always talk about implementation. This constitution, which we claim is the best in the world, is it suitable for this country? I think that's the question we should be asking. Is it suitable? to solve our problems? Does it address our problems? Thank you. Dadye, Ugat. Um, yes, uh, the, the question that was asked, you, you build your, your, your case towards free education and then going to university and saying, uh, there isn't enough money uh, to take people to university, which is true. But then I understood your question to be, have you achieved the score that allows you to go into university? I don't know whether I got that right. Now, what is the process by which you can upgrade the grades in order that uh, you either go to university or go anywhere uh, you wish uh, to go to? The, the answer to that question is we really do not give uh, people sufficient chances to fail. We've got to allow that, that people can fail. And there has to be a second chance as a policy position that allows for that kind of support. But we relegate people too quickly. Uh, and also, we don't provide enough options that children can actually take. But also, the system is not so good to actually provide the kind of ability and possibilities uh, that uh, children uh, should have. So I don't actually have an answer to a question except to really say that uh, Our policies seem to be directed at the exceptions rather than at the normal. And that in itself then creates these conditions of exclusion. That's a very big problem that we have. The second question here, oh yes, it was answered. The third question I've uh, my mind is also now not. 
Yes, 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 say it loud. Uh huh. Then the question is, which form of work should students stand for to achieve our economy? Ah, I I want to answer that question <laughs> very philosophically. We just didn't help you much, because what you want to know is what field of study. You see, the world of information technology and uh, the world of economics is very interesting how it has evolved. In Kimberley. The BA has left Kimberley with a hole in Kimberley, and there is a big hole. Uh, there is no economic activity around there. Kauteng uh, is left with a number of other holes underground uh, where gold was dug. But it also has a commercial sector center. In Egypt, along the Nile, Villages that established there were driven by agriculture. What I'm saying is that uh, the conglomerates, that is uh, how people settle, how we build cities, has been driven by economic activity. Either farming, either mining, either manufacturing, either real estate, as we see Santon and other places. There is an interesting trend of people going back to the Transkai, to all these other places, uh, probably Lesotho, uh, building big, big, big houses there. And uh, they retire from here, and then after three years they die around that big house. Now, it's an interesting phenomenon which COVID sprinted forward in very, very interesting ways. And the issue here, and uh, I'm coming to the question that has been emphasized by the chair, the, 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 the master of ceremonies here, of culture. One of the things that are emerging is what will the agglomerations of the future be driven by? That is what will be the driver of the cities of the future. Because now with information technology, you can be anywhere and work. You can go and work, stay in your big house in Transkai, and work from there. And those agglomerations attached to them is the question of culture, which is cultural economic geography. And that's a very important development that is almost spontaneously led by people who go back to their homes and build big houses across the country. Very, very massive houses are being built there. It means that the classical model of development that drives agglomerations is being diluted by the access to technology and people wanting to go and live where they live and live peacefully. So peace is one, empathy is central to that, and it's no longer the high rises of something. Security will be the main thing when we go for those agglomerations. Distribution of resources will be the main thing because the concentration of central places and urbanization will go. Now, you ask me what courses should one take? Uh, yes, science is important. Yes. Culture is central to reclaiming our values. But there's no cause called culture. It doesn't exist. And that culture means the empathy that is resident in CSE Machinini, that is resident in Steve Biko, that is resident in Lembede. That Lembede in 1944 sat with all those other people all of them lived to the age above 80. Limbede died at 33. But Limbede could, be, could trust that these people will carry the struggle forward and freedom will be achieved in their lifetime. And they kept that cradle. 
That's what culture gives you. Do we have those cultural artifacts that capture our history and define us as a nation? Well, you go to Robben Island, it's a sorry state. So what you have to study is almost infinite and everything. But culture will be central to what has to be studied in societies of the future. Uh, thank you very much. It matters to have a doctorate. It does matter to have a doctorate. Yeah, and that is very, very eloquent. Um, it's not a doctorate. It does matter to have a doctorate. Yeah, and that now we've come to a stage of uh, announcements. I think it's about books. And after that, we are going to have gifts. And after that, I saw refreshments somewhere. And then, to <laughs> Yeah, about the books. Thank you, ma'am. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you again for gracing our occasion, and we, we thank you also for your patience. We are aware our program Yaruna is running a little bit late. Um, just a quick announcement, uh, you know, a, a message of gratitude uh, to the gentleman who was rendering poetry for us this afternoon. Meg Manaka, Makumela Manaka. When we roped him in as the organizing team, we, we had a, quite an engaging discussion with him, a very passionate young man, very passionate about uh, the state of, of the youth, the country, especially education. So he's a, not only a poet, but he's also an author. So you can imagine... Um, to our marvel as the, the alumni that uh, he, number one, agreed to come and spend the, the day with us, uh, render an item. But he even went further to say, Motlatsi uh, and the entire organizing team and your alma mater, Maurice Isaacson, I'm going to donate some books as a, to the library as a token of appreciation, as a token of appreciation, I'm quoting you, to Bradziezi Machinini. Um, so he has donated uh, his books. And what I like about the books, they are so relevant, especially to what was discussed here this afternoon about languages. So it's, it's, it's a collection of poetry, but you know what? It's fantastic because he translated those books into four languages. So in, in Sipedi, in, in Zulu, Africans, I wonder translate into Africans, but I suppose we, we, we evolve as a society, right? And then one is in English. So those books, uh, young people, young learners of Morris, they will be at the library. Please go through them, enjoy them, and let them encourage you to read and also to embrace our languages. So to make Managa, we say thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you for ex inspiring our youth. So the, the, the book, so Africans, English is available. He'll be bringing it sometime in the coming days to the school. So the title, ki, ki Machuba. 
and then ungo tsimo gore ke ke the author so these are the books that are translated into the three languages that I've just explained. So thank you so much, Meg. We really appreciate it, and we definitely hope, and we are, are just sure uh, they will inspire our young people to you know, get into the, the culture of reading. And then lastly... Uh, <laughs> So, and then lastly, uh, my duty this afternoon is to just thank our program director, the Honorable Ambassador G. Over the days, we used to say prefect to prefect. Head girl to head girl. She was um, a head girl during her time, Mo, Mo Morris Isaacson. And we, we really need to acknowledge uh, when people come and spend the day with us, uh, just to, to go back to what Professor Villagas was saying. If we don't embrace where we come from, our townships, our schools here, who is going to do that for us? And to have people of your caliber, uh, Ambassador Mji. And everyone, I see when I cast my eyes around, I see a whole lot of uh, astute alumni of the school. And we say to you, uh, we see you. We see you, you inspire us, and we are thankful that you, know, you, you are behind us and you are supporting us. When these kids see those people who came before us, they get inspired. And we also, in return, get inspired so that they can do the same with the next generation. So I wish to uh, uh, present you with a token of appreciation to say thank you for, for making time. We hope she'll enjoy the, 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 the orchids. Thank you so much. And some nice. and some reading in oh, here. Oh, good! <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you very okay, much. Okay, thank you. So I'll hand over to to the rest of the team to do the presentation of gifts. Thank you. Before I call upon the Deputy Principal, Ms. Secreto Savangwani, I hope it's V, not B, like Mombobang, am I right? <laughs> to give us a vote of thanks. Now that also my national agenda has caught up with you, the audience. I want you to know that we are organizing in Pretoria workshops to teach those of us who are available how to teach African languages. We'll have three, a three day, well, three, three phases of the workshops, which is offered to teach because we know our languages, but this very educated lady said, no, 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 Rotonese really rude. Or how do you teach young children? To, 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 to read and write their own languages. After Honale, the scandal, study grade two, three, and four, 
who can't read or write, and we felt that they need to learn our languages. So those of you who are here in Soweto will be doing first Pretoria, and then we are going to come and also do Soweto. So you can always get my contact details from Motlazi if you are interested in learning how to teach young children how to read and write in their own languages. Now, she said if we are good, if we're done in that, she'll also teach us how to write books in our languages for our young children. And join us. Our children don't have fathers. And it's part of the problems we are having in the society, Zadinya open and so on. They don't have role figures, Zabundati. So join us when we teach these young children the, 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 their African languages so that they can see that Libon Dadi are part of this thing. And uh, let me thank you all for being such a wonderful audience, to be so well behaved and to be so dynamic, interacting, so that now I can call the deputy principal and ask him, please, to come and do his vote of thanks. Naksa Amun. Thank you very much. Dumelang, Sanwanani, Mangwanani. <laughs> no, I'm just checking. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, it was a wonderful day. Let me say it. Um, I like this. I am so inspiring by the speakers, professors, doctors, distinguished guests. You know, uh, it was very educational. Yes, it used to be. But um, for the mere fact that when I look at um, my learners. Today they are in, in numbers. I really appreciate. So let me first uh, thank the program director. You were very wonderful. I think we, we, we have learned a lot on how to run the program like this one. She was so wonderful. Thank you very much for directing this show up to this end. Thank you very much. Thank you, professors. Thank you, doctors. Everybody who is here, I thank you very much. But I just want to say something a bit. I'm not opening anything or any question or delivering a speech. That our learners, please be strong. I'm a history teacher. I used to tell them that, um, you know, the class of 1976 was very passionate. They knew what they wanted to achieve. Let me be honest. Whether one like it or not, whether you are a professor, whether you are a doctor, whether you are a teacher or you are a principal, you cannot correct anything in this world. The only person who can, co can correct is the youth. But now the question is, as youth, as a class of today, 2023, and I know people are hungry, but this I must say it. <laughs> uh, let me shorten it. What I want to say is, 
they are the only people who can correct the situation. If a recommendation can be done by whoever up there, I'm telling you, it's, it will never work. So, my beautiful learners, please be strong. Challenge the situation. Don't be like those people who, of course, when they have problems, they will just close the, the road and stuff. They don't go to the right offices. Go to the right places and then, uh, believe me or not, you can correct the situation. I don't want to talk about whatever situation that was alluded here, but they know what I'm talking about because every day I am liaising with them. Uh, thank you very much for being part of this program. Thank you. Um, sorry, sorry, everyone. Just a one-minute thing. There's, you'll see on the side of the, the, the passage, there's uh, catering that has been prepared. Please grab something for yourself on your way out, and then there will be a few of us that will remain behind the people who have been, who've been uh, tasked to deal with our VIPs. Please let us allow our VIPs to go out, and then the rest of us will be served as we go out. Thank you.